It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In John chapter 11, we find Jesus at a pivotal moment in his life. His popularity is at an all-time high, yet the shadow <clears throat> of, the cro- <clears throat> of the cross is beginning to darken the scene. Jesus is only days away from nails being hammered into his hands and feet, a crown of thorns pressed into his head. He is about ready to drink the cup of God's wrath for humanity. But before he goes to the cross, he has one more public and irrefutable miracle to do. He is going to raise Lazarus, his good friend Lazarus. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And there are three scenes in the story I want to draw our attention to this morning. Scene number one is that Jesus loves. Jesus loves. If you look at verse one, it says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. The obvious problem in the story is that Lazarus is sick. And this is not a little cold. This is more than the sniffles. Mary and Martha fear for his life. And Jesus, their good friend and miracle worker, is not there. Verse 3. So the sisters sent a message to him. Lord, the one you love is sick. Remember, there are no cell phones, no texting, no emails. Someone had to actually physically go and deliver this message to Jesus. They had to find Jesus and deliver this message. Lord, the one that you love is sick. Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. John makes it clear in chapter 11 that Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He doesn't just say he loved them. He says that Jesus loved Martha, her sister, And Lazarus. And this truth about the love of Christ needs to be in our minds because Jesus is about ready to blow up two subtle and very common expectations many of us have in following Christ. Remember that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they're not strangers to Jesus. Jesus knows them, Jesus loves them, and they love Jesus. They are devoted followers of Jesus, they are part of his inner circle. And so over the course of time, uh, expectations begin to develop in their hearts, just like they begin to develop in our hearts. And we see some of these expectations in the text. The first is that if I follow Jesus, I will not experience pain and suffering. If I follow Jesus, I will not experience pain and suffering. Suffering is for the heathens. It's for the pagans. It's for the godless. It's for the Swifties or whoever else it is that you don't like or whatever. It's just for other people. It's for other people. And they suffer because they don't know God. But I know God and I love God. And I'm doing the right thing, and so I should be immune from pain and suffering. Subtle expectation number two is that if I do experience experience pain and suffering, Jesus will get me out of it. If I do experience pain and suffering, Jesus will get me out of it. Look at verse three. So the sisters sent a message to him. Lord, the one you love is sick. Notice they do not say his name. They don't say Lazarus is sick. They say, you know, the one that you love your best friend, your closest amigo, he's sick. And they don't say, Jesus, can you come and heal him? They don't, they don't make that request. They say, just give Jesus the news, and Jesus will know exactly what to do. They assume that Jesus will come and heal Lazarus. They knew, they knew that Jesus could heal, and they knew that Lazarus was loved deep, deeply by Jesus. And so it, it would make sense that Jesus, their good friend, who's healed countless other people, would come and heal their friend or their brother, Lazarus. Verses 1 through 5, John is building the expectation that in verse 6, Jesus is going to heal Lazarus. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, you you expect John to write, he dropped everything and went to Lazarus. But that's not what it says. It says he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So, so when he heard that he was sick, he stays two more days. He doesn't go to Lazarus. And this would have been confusing for everyone involved. Like, why don't you go to Lazarus? You know, if my wife calls me and she says, hey, uh, honey, uh, there's an emergency. I need to talk to you. I, I don't pull out my calendar and say, you know, sugar, uh, maybe on Thursday we can chat. I, I don't do that. Uh, I'm like, okay, this, it's an emergency. You need me? Okay, I'll drop whatever I'm doing to make sure everything's okay. And that's what you do when the people you love are in trouble. You go to them. If, if at all possible, you try to go help them. Yet, 
verse 6 is making it clear that Jesus stayed where he was at two more days and, and that it was an act of love. So if you said, Jesus, why did you stay for two more days? It is because he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is what the word so means in verse 6. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So let me decode this. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, so he let Lazarus die. This is what John's saying. He let his good friend, his faithful follower, die. Why? Because he loved him. Which challenges our understanding of what love is. So what is love? If you had to define love, how would you define love? Well, my favorite definition is that love pursues the highest good of another, even at great personal cost. That, that love is not just about fulfilling the, the weaker or lesser passing desires of people. It is pursuing the highest good of another, even at great personal cost. And so what is your highest good? What do you need most in your life? What do you need more than, <clears throat> than anything else? If you could ask God for one thing right now, if you could ask God for one thing right now, and you know you, you would get it, what would you ask him for? Naturally, our minds sprint towards material things. If you're single, maybe you're thinking, oh God, give me a great spouse. Give me a great husband or great wife. If you're starting a business, maybe you're thinking, man, God, give me success in my work. Or sometimes I think, oh God, give me, give me the right lottery ticket to win the lottery. Now, do you, I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever had that thought, but or if you've ever played this game with your kids, if you won the lottery, what would you do? We played this game a few times, and one time my son said, Dad, if I win the lottery, I'm going to buy you a car. And I said, great, what kind of car? And he said, I would buy you a 2008 Toyota Corolla. That's what I'd buy you. I, I said, how fiscally responsible, son, thank you. No, he didn't say that. He said, Dad, if I win the lottery, I'm going to buy you two Lamborghinis, one for you and one for Mom. I said, now we're talking. So there we go. There we go. But naturally, that's where our minds go. We, we think to ourselves, oh, man, we can get more stuff or more of the reputation that we want or more of the relationships with people that we want. We, we think about material goods. And so it's natural for us to assume that when Jesus loves us, that it looks like material blessing. So what does it look like for Jesus to love you? It means, like, it means that you experience success or you fall in love with the right person, or your kids experience success. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus blesses us in so many different ways. He blesses us with, with so many good things to enjoy. But he is not only loving you when he, get, when he gives you success. That's not the only time he's really loving you. Ultimately, Jesus is pursuing our highest good. He's meeting our deepest needs because he loves us. So what is your greatest need? What is your highest good? Well, the answer is that your greatest need, your highest good, is to see the glory of God. It is to see the glory of God. John eleven four. 4, when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Certainly, Jesus knows Lazarus is going to die. But he says the end doesn't end in death. But it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. John 11, verse 40, Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? This is what Jesus is driving towards in the passage. We have been created by God, and we have been created for God. And the deepest need in your life right now is not that your problems go away. That's not the deepest need. It's not that all your problems just go, go away. Your deepest need is to see the glory of God, to know the God who made you. This is what we're created for. We've been created to know our maker, to know the one who lived for us and died for us and rose again from the dead. It is the love of Jesus that lets Lazarus die. And it, it is the love of Jesus that lets Mary and Martha suffer. Why? Is it because he's cruel? No, no. It's because he loves us. This is why John keeps repeating, he loved them. He loved them. He loved them. He loved them. It's so that Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and many others might see the glory of God. And so, brothers and sisters, when you suffer, and you will, 
when you suffer and when you walk through the land of confusion and despair, when your soul groans, you must not think God does not love me. You must not think God is not being good to us. We must not think to ourselves God is not really committed to us. Rather, we must remember that Jesus is committed to our highest good. He is committed to our deepest joy that can only be found in him. So scene number one is that Jesus loves. Scene number two is that Jesus ministers. He ministers. Jesus is going to Bethany for several reasons. One of them being that he's going to minister to Mary and Martha before he raises Lazarus from the dead. And this decision just about gives the disciples a heart attack. In John chapter 11, verse 8, Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? And they're like, wait a second. We were just in Jerusalem and they tried to stone you. They tried to kill you. They picked up stones, full-grown men that are overwhelmed with anger to the point of committing murder. They pick up stones and they're, they're trying to throw them at Jesus to kill him. And that, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to kill you by stoning. Uh, I hope not. But that would be a pretty traumatic experience. Not pleasant. Terrible. And the, the, the disciples had just experienced this, and now they're safe and they're away. And Jesus says, we're going back. We're going back. They're like, are you sure? Are you sure we should do that? And he's, he's not only going to go to Bethany, he's going to go all the way to Jerusalem, and he's going to go all the way to the cross. He knows where he's going. And this is where we see one of the principles uh, in the passage, which is that Jesus meets us in our suffering. What is Jesus like when you're suffering? What is Jesus like when you're wrestling, when your soul groans, when you don't understand what's going on? Well, Jesus meets us in our suffering. The God of the universe has sovereignly ordained all of our suffering. Every trial you walk through, he has sovereignly ordained it, and he promises to walk with us through it. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He is near the brokenhearted. Hearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Or consider the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians of all time, that God used the Apostle Paul to turn the world upside down, to write much of the Bible. Paul, he followed the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully for decades, and he suffered immensely. And at the end of his life, uh, he's sitting in jail, he's writing a letter to Timothy's protege as he awaits his execution. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, these are not the final words that Paul wrote, but almost the final words. I mean, just, he only has a few more verses left in chapter 4. And this is what he says. At my first defense, no one stood by me. But everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. At my first defense, no one stood by me. But everyone deserted me. May it never be counted, may it not be counted against them. So how do you stand? How do you keep going even if your closest friends abandon you? Verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. This is his confidence. This, is, this, this was the Apostle Paul's endurance. His ability to keep going is he knew Christ was ministering to him. Christ was standing with him. That Christ was walking with him all the way to the point of death. And so Jesus is going to Bethany to minister to Mary and Martha, these two women that he loves. And Martha is up first. Verse 17, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. So that's really dead. He's super dead at this point. Uh, Jesus doesn't show up right after Lazarus had died. That's not what happens. I mean, there had already been hours and hours and hours of crying and weeping and wondering that that have That has taken place. The reality of death has set in. And that's when he shows up. After he's been in the tomb for four days. The funeral, in one sense, the burial has already happened. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Martha, the firstborn, she is the firstborn go-getter, and she jumps right into her heartache. 
She sees him, she goes after him, and the first thing she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Lord, where were you? Where were you? If you had been here, everything would have been different. And in tragedy, it is easy to wonder, God, what are you doing? Do you really care about me? Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so this is an expression of her heartache. It's also an expression of her faith. Like she really believes in in Christ. She says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She's acknowledging his power, his sovereignty over life and death. And she still hasn't given up hope in verse 22. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Hint, hint, raise him. (laughs) Raise him. You can raise him. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. Verse 23. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha says, okay, Jesus, I've been listening to you teach. I know the Old Testament scriptures. I know there's coming a future resurrection at the last day. At the last day. I know I'll see him again, but I miss him. And I was hoping to spend more, many more years with him. All death, in one sense, is a tragedy. All death. But sudden death, unexpected death, is different. When someone dies when they're 100 years old, a good long life, that's one thing. It's in a very real sense, it's a tragedy. But when someone dies unexpectedly at 25, it's a different type of tragedy. You're caught off guard. Lazarus just got sick, like he had gotten sick many times before, just like all of us. And then he died. He died. Martha says, we weren't ready Where were you? Didn't you get our message? Didn't you know that he was sick? You knew he was sick. Why didn't you come? She says, I know I'll see him again. So she's still wrestling in her heart over the sadness she's experiencing. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, you don't quite get it, Martha. You don't quite get it. I am the resurrection and the life. There's not just going to be a resurrection in the end. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is the central point of the passage. Everything is driving towards this. It's it's driving towards who Jesus Christ is. He is the resurrection, and he is the life. And he asks her the question, do you believe this? And I love her response. Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Notice how Jesus ministers to Martha. He gives her promises. Martha needed to be reminded of who Jesus is. And I love her confession, even in in her grief. This is a wonderful example for us about what, what does it look like to persevere in faith even when you're suffering. I love her confession. You, You can feel the conflict in her soul. Why did you let my brother die? And why weren't you here? And yet, I still believe you're the son of God. You you are the one that all the scriptures point to. You are the Messiah. And see, there is so much in life that we're not going to understand. Like we're just, if you live long enough, there's so many situations and conversations and tragedies, difficulties that you're not going to understand. And you're going to have a million questions. And sometimes those Questions are answered, and a lot of times, they don't. And sometimes you're not going to know how long the difficulty is going to go on for. Uh, th- that's part of what makes enduring difficult. When you're walking through a difficult season, and you, d- you just don't, you don't know, is this going to be a week? Is it going to be a month? Is it going to be five years? You know when you call customer service, and they tell you, your wait time is 15 minutes. It, just that information, it helps you to make a decision. Do I want to wait? Do I not want to wait? But if you don't know how long you're waiting, it's very hard to wait. Or you go to Disney World, and the wait time, you know, for rides, it's very long. But they, they'll just tell you up front, okay, your wait time for this ride is three days. Or, you know, whatever, or like whatever it is. But people, if people know, then they're able to make a decision. But what happens when you don't know? <laughs> what do you do when you don't know? What do you do with unanswered questions? And see, Martha is in the middle of her struggle. She's, she's holding on to Christ 
even though she doesn't have all the answers. And so she's a wonderful example. Martha is a wonderful example. And then he ministers to Mary. Verse 32. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so in some ways, this is a very similar encounter. In some ways, it's a little bit different. It, it is as if when Mary sees Jesus, she just comes undone. She comes undone. As soon as Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she sees him. She fell at his feet. She just falls down. And she says exactly what Martha says. So Mary and Martha say exactly the same thing. So you expect Jesus to say the same thing to Mary that he said to Martha. You expect verse 33 to say, I am the resurrection and the life. But that's not what he does. Look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Another verse about the love of Christ for Lazarus. Now, many have wondered about verse 25. Uh, I, I was reading a little bit this week about how many pastors over the years, they preached very famous messages, three, four, five, six, seven messages on those two words, Jesus wept. It, it is so profound to think about the creator of the universe becoming a man and weeping. He's weeping. Now, why does he weep? At least two reasons. First, Jesus is ministering to Mary. He is ministering to Mary. What elicits the emotion of Jesus? It's not the news that Lazarus died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her crying, when he saw her crying, when he saw the sadness because of the death of Lazarus, this is what elicits the emotion of Jesus. Verse 32, as soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. She fell at his feet. She, Jesus understands the tragedy, the difficulty. Jesus knew that Mary needed something different than Martha. Jesus is practicing Romans 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. How do you love people well? Well, this is one of the greatest verses on love in all the Bible. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is what Jesus is doing. He's entering into the suffering of Martha. You know, my first response when I was uh, studying this week, when I saw verse 35, Jesus wept, my first response was, that's weird, because he knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows. He knows what's going to happen. So you would think he wouldn't be sad about what had happened. But imagine if Jesus said to Mary, you know, get up off the ground, Mary, stop crying, you're acting like a baby, I'm going to raise him anyways. That's not what he does. He enters into her suffering. And, and sometimes the greatest way to minister to people in grief is not to show up and to give them a lecture about the truth. Sometimes the greatest way to minister to people in their sadness is, is to just weep with them. And, and this is what Jesus does. This is what he does. Hebrews 4, 15 says, For we, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been <clears throat> tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, here's the application. Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. This is exactly what Mary and Martha do. They approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, we have a, a high priest who's been tempted every way that we have been. He sympathizes with us. He's entered into, he's entered into our world as a human being. He, he knows difficulty. He knows sorrow. He carried our sicknesses. He's carried our pain. And so the writer of Hebrews says, go to him. Go to him. He knows what you need. He knows what you need. Martha needed to be reminded of who Jesus is. I am the resurrection and the life. Mary needed Jesus to weep with her. And here's a principle that I think will help you navigate uh, some pain and difficulty in your life. Here's the principle. 
It's that there's a type of comfort that the soul needs in time of grief that only Jesus can give. There's a type of comfort that the soul needs in times of grief that only Jesus can give. We're told twice in John 11 that friends came to comfort Mary and Martha to to weep with them. And that's a great thing. We need friends. But we're also told that Mary and Martha left their friends to go be with Jesus. So their options were be with their friends or be with Jesus. And it says that Martha left to go be with Jesus and Mary left to go be with Jesus. So don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying you don't need friends. I'm not saying you don't need friends to walk through difficulty in life. What I'm saying is that there's a type of comfort that your soul needs that only Jesus can provide. And in John chapter 11, Jesus is pouring the healing oil of his grace into their souls. I think sometimes what can happen is we we hope to find that healing grace in other people. And other people just can't provide it. So go to Christ. Go to him. He, he, is, he is the one who will not abandon us in our difficulty. He's the one who will minister to our souls. Another reason Jesus is weeping is because he's responding to Lazarus. He's responding to Lazarus. The reality of Lazarus, his friend, dying is setting in. And he knew the pain and the sorrow and the anguish Lazarus went through in his dying. Death is a horrible reality. It's horrible. Jesus hates death. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved. This word means angry. He's angry. There's a a sadness, a sorrow, and an anger towards death. Sin is terrible and it ruins everything because it brings death. The consequence of sin is death. It's corruption. It's perversion. It ruins everything. And this is why Jesus came. He came to defeat death. Death is an enemy that none of us can defeat on our own. And so Jesus came into the world to put to death death, to deal with death permanently. This is why he came. And so when he sees Lazarus, I don't think it's just the death of Lazarus. It is the death of Lazarus, but it's the reality of death itself that has ruined the world that the Lord Jesus has made. And so there's a righteous anger and sorrow that comes with it. Now, as the story unfolds, John mentions that there are some in the crowd. So if you're, if you're trying to envision the story, there's Mary and Martha, and there are all these people, and they're real followers of Jesus, but then there are some in the crowds looking for reasons not to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And there's this incredible contrast where Mary and Martha are walking through the pain of death and holding on to Christ. They're, they're, they're in the middle of the pain. They're holding on to Christ, but then there are others observing the situation, looking for reasons not to believe. Verse 37. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? So they they are looking for reasons not to believe. And if you are looking for reasons not to trust in Christ, you can always find them. You can always justify unbelief. It takes zero skill to come up with reasons not to trust Christ. There are many reasons. Now, I'm not saying there are good reasons not to believe. I mean, look at their reasoning itself. It's self-refuting. Couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes? Wait a second. Are you saying that Jesus could open up people's eyes? You're granting the point that Jesus can open up people's eyes? And if he can open up people's eyes, shouldn't you believe he's the son of God? It's self-refuting. But you see that as Jesus is making his way to the cross, that Jesus has enemies. But in many ways, this is a setup, that what Jesus is doing is he's, it's, he's setting up his enemies. Jesus' popularity is at an all-time high, but as his popularity grows, envy and murder are flooding the hearts of his enemies, and he's drawing them in. He's drawing everybody to the tomb of Lazarus, his friends, his followers, and his enemies. This sets up the third scene, which is that Jesus raises he raises Lazarus from the dead verse 38 then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb it was a cave and a stone was lying against it remove the stone Jesus said Martha the dead man's sister told him 
Lord, there is already a stench because he has been dead for days. Now, I don't usually like to read the King James Version, but I like the translation of the King James in verse 39. It just says, Lord, Lazarus stinketh. <laughs> Lazarus stinketh. He stinketh, which is a good verse if you have teenage sons because they stinketh. Mm. They stinketh. <laughs> He's dead. He's really dead. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, now, verse 41. Okay, just try to put yourself there. Verse 41. So they removed the stone. Can you imagine the scene? He, he's gathering everyone to the tomb of Lazarus, and they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, see, he's gathered the crowd to the tomb of Lazarus. I said this so that they may believe you sent me. Thousands of people gathered around the tomb of Lazarus. I mean, this is either going to be the greatest miracle of all time or the biggest flop in human history. <laughs> I mean, if you're like digging up somebody's grave and pulling up the casket and opening it up. Hey, I'm just going to, hey, everyone meet at this person's grave. We're going to open it up. This is going to go, I mean, it's going to go well or bad. Verse 43. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Then the dead man came out bound, hand and foot, with linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. This is the most public and powerful miracle that Jesus ever did. Besides the resurrection, there's no miracle that points to his deity. Who has power over life? and death. Who can raise a man who's been dead for four days? One scholar said this, I liked it. He said, if Jesus had not specified Lazarus come out, every dead body would have risen from the dead. I, I love that. He had to specify Lazarus, not, all of, not everyone else. Like, you stay in the grave. Lazarus, you come out. What more do you need to believe, crowd? What more do you need before you repent and put your trust in the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. So you expect verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. Of course, how could you not? What you might not expect is verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Verse 53. So from that day, they plotted to kill him. So their conclusion is, He's getting too powerful. There's too much. He's, he's drawing too many people to himself. So Jesus needs to die, and while we're at it, so does Lazarus. He raised the guy who stinketh from the grave. He needs to die. He needs to die. And John is just helping us understand the story as Jesus approaches the cross. Now, what do we learn? Well, there's much here to learn, but I just want to highlight one truth here. It's that the resurrection of Jesus is the resolution to every problem, including death. The resurrection of Jesus is the salute resolution to every problem, including death. Physical death is horrible, and it is designed to point to the ultimate death in hell. Physical death is horrible. Hell is eternally and infinitely worse. And so this physical death, someone dying physically, it's, oh, it's awful. But we should say, oh, no, what about the reality of hell? And just like Martha understood, there's coming the resurrection at the very end, the last day, where people will be, everyone will be resurrected, some to eternal life and some to eternal death. Meaning physical death is not the ultimate death. I mean, if Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, but... What that means for Lazarus is that he has to die twice. He, didn't, he wasn't resurrected to live forever. He was resurrected and now from the dead, and now he has to die twice. And if he dies a second time and goes to hell, what good is that first resurrection from the dead? It doesn't matter. See, death is the consequence of sin. It's the price that all of us must pay for our sin. Physical death and spiritual death in hell. But see, that's why Christ came into the world. He, he came into the world to die our death. The, the, 
the God of glory, the one who made heaven and earth, the one who is holy and good and glorious, he's the one who became a man and lived our life and he died our death that we might live forever. This is why he tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. I mean, Jesus is totally realistic about death in this life. Even if you die, you're gonna die. He says, what I offer you is much better than just a resurrected life for a few more years before you die again. What I offer you is eternal life. Even if you die, you can live. How can he say that? How do you die, or how do you live if you die? Well, it's because, see, for Christians, if you're a Christian, when your heart stops beating in your chest, which it will one day, your last breath in this life is your first breath in the presence of Christ forever. So even though you die, you live. You live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So in that sense, he can say, you'll never die. You won't skip a beat. Your heart stops beating. You're dead. Open your eyes in the presence of Christ. Where there is pleasure forevermore. Joy. Inexpressible joy forever. Do you believe this? And something I I, I couldn't help but observe this week is that all the pain and all the groaning and all the sorrow that Mary and Martha had was instantly turned into joy at the resurrection of Lazarus. I mean, you, you, you sense in the story Mary and Martha wrestling, oh, all the crying, all the confusion, where were you, Jesus, and things not making sense. But at the moment of Lazarus, Lazarus's re- resurrection, it's like, it's just joy. <laughs> it's just joy. And see, Mary and Martha... They had a very painful week. This, this was a painful episode for maybe a week. A few days of Lazarus getting sick and then dying, being dead for four days. And brothers and sisters, you might have a painful 40 years. You don't understand what's going on. You, questions in your heart it might last many years. But see, all the pain and all the sorrow and all the wrestling will instantly be turned to joy at the resurrection. It, it's all transformed. And, we'll, and in that day, we'll say, I get it. I see it. I mean, it's just like, just like Mary, Mary and Martha. It's like, just joy. And on that day, it's just joy. And so now, the fight now, what, what Christ is asking us to do now is to trust him. It's to trust him through the pain and the confusion, and the difficulty. Don't throw away your confession. Remember, Martha? I believe you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who, who's coming into the world. So don't throw away your confession. And so Christ looks at you and says, trust me. And he says, let me minister to you. Let me meet your need. And so I just want to close by reading verse 26. You can think about this verse. It's a great promise. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I hope you do. Let's pray. Father, thank you.